I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to Vlog 224, Becoming a Lecturer. This vlog comes via request from Olivia. Hi Olivia, you are wonderful. And Olivia, I've split your request about lecturing and becoming a lecturer into three parts. So the next couple of vlogs following this one will continue to answer your key question. This first vlog is entering the space of becoming. So the lecturer role and what that means and how you enter it in a stable and self-aware fashion. But the vlog that will follow then will be more operational. So how to make a lecture work. And the one that follows looks at the radical transformations of the lecture in the online digitized environment. So let's have a laugh, let's have a good time. But today is about getting you ready to take a job in difficult times. Okay, let's do this. Let's become a lecturer. Now, teaching is the foundation of lecturing roles. So you need to exhibit, exhibit, perform, display teaching skills. How do you therefore demonstrate expertise in teaching in higher education? And that's a tough question because these lectureship roles are incredibly precious. For so many reasons, they're rare, but they're precious because you are charged with creating a learning culture. You are charged with inspiring and engaging the next generation of scholars. No pressure. But as a PhD student, think about the jobs you normally undertake, the casualised work. So you run a tutorial, you may be a demonstrator in a lab, maybe you deliver the occasional lecture. Now this is the problem. How do you demonstrate the capacity to scaffold yourself from these isolated, bespoke, relatively small teaching and learning activities? How can you make that leap or that jump to a contract lecturer post? There it is, isn't it? And I know for thousands of you watching this vlog today, that's exactly your problem. You've done your tutoring, you've done your small scale teaching, but you want to go to the next stage. And how do you prove that? How can you prove that you're good at teaching and learning, that you can be a lecturer? And what I really need to do is get you ready for that jump. We have to get your career ready. We have to get your CV ready so that you can, with your eyes wide open, take that next step if and when it is offered. But also preparing you that you know what you're in for when that job is actually offered to you. And as I always say, there's a lot of content in this vlog and the next two, big literature that I've been working on for about 20 years. So if there's a bit of this vlog that you would like me to extend that you think is its own thing, then send me an email, we'll have a chat about that because there's a lot of content I'm getting through here. Olivia's request though, did really strike me. I thought it was a very powerful request and so when we were getting out of the comma series I knew becoming a lecturer would be one of our first stops on the way out. And it is important to me personally, it is important to me professionally and getting that early stage of your academic career right is absolutely crucial. Now, as some of you may know, I had two lecturing posts before I entered a tenured academic post. And so it's pretty important because we've got friends all over the world that watch these vlogs, a lot of friends in North America. And therefore, let's just do some definitional work so we all agree when I'm using the word lecturer, uh, how that translates internationally. So let's put some definitions in place. So we all know at the moment, higher education is composed of a casual or casualized workforce. So that's often called the adjunct academy, sessionals, the precariat. So this is where you tutor, you demonstrate, you deliver the occasional lecture and you mark a great deal. And these activities in the old days used to accompany a PhD. So when you did a PhD, you did these relatively straightforward small tasks. But because of the radical changes to international higher education, this adjunct academy, this casual work, can go on indefinitely. Mm -hmm. And therefore, that's why we have lectureships. 
So these are often termed assistant professorships in the North American system. So these are the non-tenured or tenurable posts. This is contract work, right? So not the sessional, not the adjunct, not the tenured. This is the contract work. So you get a contract to teach for six months, a year, two years, three, and maybe if you're lucky, five years. These contracts may be renewed, but they probably won't be renewed. And they're often funded as teaching backfill positions. And what I mean by that is somebody gets a research grant and part of that grant is they relinquish their teaching responsibilities and then you require a contract to backfill that teaching responsibility while they're doing their research, okay? So the, they're often, in a lot of systems, we have tenured lectureships. So that's why the word's a bit complicated. In the Australian system, you can be a lecturer and tenured, right? But what I'm talking about today, just for simplicity, is the contract posts, okay? So this is very distinct from the permanent tenured academic post. So as you can see, my frame of reference today is that difficult, complicated, in-between job between the casualised workforce and the tenured workforce. Let's sit in the uncomfortable middle. And as you've often heard me say, when you get that chance to enact a six month or a 12 month or two years or three or five year contract, you need to grab it with both hands. Don't even think about it. If you get a contract, grab it. Grab it. But then the next question is, how do you personally and professionally make that lift? How can you make sure you've got the skill base so if the chance comes, you can take it? Now, most of you know my professional story. When I did my research master's degree, I applied for and got how, how long ago was this? A teaching apprenticeship. So I was the one person at the university, and it was very competitive, who was able to become a teaching apprentice during my research masters. And that meant I got the opportunity to do teaching, but also I got a teaching and learning professional development suite, which was absolutely fantastic. So during this teaching apprenticeship, uh, I did tutoring, I did lecturing, I also wrote curriculum and learned about curricular design. And then I moved to another university to do my PhD, and I had more casual work than I could humanly imagine doing. Tutorials were everywhere, marking was everywhere, there was more teaching available than I could humanly do. So during that period, I did a lot of tutorials, I did a hell of a lot of marking, and I also watched the management of a large course. Uh, can I say it was not well managed either, so I watched it a bit like a slow, a slow train wreck. Now I was 23 at this time, and famously my PhD supervisor said I would be his casual tutor until I was 35. <laughs> no chats, no chats. But what do you do? And I know there are thousands of you in this situation. How do you get that first run? So you're doing all these shoots, you're doing all this marking and, and paying your bills to a certain point. But how do you stabilise for a time? And to prepare yourself for this moment, you have to work. You have to work on teaching and learning. And I'm not talking about content delivery here. I'm talking about content creation. I'm talking about curricular design, assessment design, differentiated learning strategies, interface management. The list can go on and on and on. So every minute that you can work on teaching and learning skills and abilities, that's a really good minute. Because I did that work and I was lucky, it's both, I did the heavy lifting, I learnt, but I also was lucky when the Victoria University in Aotearoa, New Zealand needed a quick replacement, a teaching backfill for a research grant, I was able to go. In less than a month, I was able to write a curriculum very, very quickly and develop a course from the first lecture through assessment through to the exam. Three lectures a week, more tutorials than I can count. This was heavy lifting. And no matter how well I did, and I did pretty well. No matter how well I did, 
there was no extension available to that contract because the gentleman was coming back. So it was a one year deal. But it did become the foundation for my next lectureship, my next contract post. And if I hadn't done that year with those experiences show that I can lecture, I wouldn't have been shortlisted for the next post. And the two other gentlemen that were shortlisted with me were both in teaching contracts, right? So if I'd stayed at my university where I was doing these temporary or, you know, tutorials and the endless marking, I wouldn't have been shortlisted because I demonstrated I could teach a large course, a lectureship. I was shortlisted and then got the next contract. So I got it. That was a three-year contract. I stayed for 18 months and then went on to a tenured, that is permanent, academic post. So the point of these jobs is no one cares about you at all. You are simply there to fulfill functions. You are there to fill a gap. And what's happened is they've worked out it's cheaper to fill that gap with a short contract rather than casuals. Uh, if casuals can do the jobs, casuals will always do the jobs, but a lectureship is put in place when they actually do the sums, and as a head of school I've done this, done the sums and gone, actually it's cheaper to hire someone for six months to do this work or a year to do this work than it would be for casuals. So no one is interested in your research. No one is interested in your future. They want you to do the job with as few student complaints as possible. Also, you will be exploited <coughs> in these junior lectureship posts. All the courses that the senior staff do not want to teach, they will handball straight onto you, often at incredibly short notice. The teaching load I had in these jobs looking back on it now, was absolutely stunning. I don't know how I did it, to be frank. Uh, one semester, I was managing eight different courses. Two of them <laughs> were put on my teaching load on a Thursday to start teaching them on the Monday. But my advice every time to every single one of you is if one of these contract jobs come up, Jump, take it, you must take it, take it, take it, take it, take it. This will be a jump from casualised work. They will be increasingly rare and you need to grab that opportunity when they appear. And of course, in this type of post, you will learn incredibly quickly. So let's go through my 10 tips to prepare you to take this job and once you're in it, to be able to manage this job. Let's stabilise you while you were there. One sell your PhD and its role and impact and value in teaching and learning. You are not competitive for a lectureship these days, a contract post, without a PhD. So the PhD is a foundational skill. Just to give you an example, I was on an appointment panel for a lectureship. We had 93 applications for that lectureship, 93. 90 of those people had a PhD. So the first cut we made was the three people that were doing a PhD year by. So a PhD is what you need. You'll have to demonstrate how the expertise that you deployed in your PhD, in your research, also provides a unique set of skills for your teaching and learning. Now this is hard to do, but basically what I'm asking you to do, heavy lifting, heavy thinking, is what is the value of your research to teaching? So construct the narratives, tell the stories about how you link your research to your teaching. This is important stuff. And that's why I always say to you, by the way, think about publishing SOTL, scholarship of teaching and learning. Think about publishing SOTL, learning-led research. The reason why I say publish in these areas is firstly it's publishing, but also that research demonstrates that you are a thoughtful educator and you are contributing to the research into teaching in your field. Boom. So how is your PhD part of your teaching and learning story? Particularly, look at the gaps in the curriculum. How can you fix the problems in a particular faculty or college or school? How can you fix their problems by enhancing it through your research? So lecturers 
solve problems. Teaching will take over your life, it always does, but your role as a lecturer is to solve problems. And one of the ways that you solve problems is show the value of the research in your PhD to their curricular challenges. Two, reflect on your personal attributes. Now, these are often described as soft skills. Soft. What a ridiculous phrase, right? Dreadful description. Because think about it. What are soft skills? Good communication skills. Getting on with people. Collegiality. Good teamwork. Building relationships. Right. So think about your capacity to explore, to understand and manage cultural differences. <laughs> That's probably the most important issue in the culture right now. How and why do you manage cultural differences and what does management look like for you? Unpick that. So start with making connections. How do you understand the cultural differences in our students? How do you transform your curriculum in relation to the diversity of your students? How do you manage assessment? How do you manage your interfaces, your information platforms? Now, all of these are crucial questions. These are not soft skills. These are crucial skills. Three, be passionate about teaching and learning. We live in a time that values research and teaching is described as the housework of our universities. Senior people are bought out, what a dreadful phrase, bought out of teaching so that they can concentrate on research. But what no one tells you is that you are actually safer as an academic if you are an excellent teacher and an excellent researcher because teaching pays the bills. So it's a necessity. But if you can demonstrate enthusiasm, if you can demonstrate passion for teaching and learning, then you are incredibly valuable. Tell you why. All learning is based on motivation. Every study of undergraduate teaching and learning that you can find is based on how do we summon the motivation of students to enable their learning. So if you're not interested in teaching and learning, if you just think, oh, you're yeah, not terribly interested, why would the students be interested, right? So motivating your students starts with motivating yourself. Lecturing is really, really hard work. Being a lecturer is really, really hard work. So you have to do it. Wow, you have to do it for a reason beyond the paycheck or beyond cross-subsidising your research. So spend time thinking about your motivations and then how you move your motivations into enabling the motivations of your students. Yeah, four, <laughs> never forget about your research. Never forget about your research. This is probably the most important tip I could ever convey to you in life. Teaching takes over your life. Teaching first year students particularly takes over your life. But you must remain research active. You must continue your research activity. You may have no time. You have to find the time. You may be hired as a lecturer on a short term contract, right? So it's about teaching. But you're going to get the next contract, you're going to get the next job on the basis of your research. You have to not only demonstrate research activity, but demonstrate that you have an independent research profile and also an independent research plan. So try and be the lead author of articles, so important for the physical and biological sciences. But you need to develop a research plan. Have an independent plan beyond your PhD and you're gonna to have to convey that plan. Find new strategies to develop research collaborations, develop relationships between teaching and research. That's the trick, to be honest. You're gonna be spending so much time doing the teaching and learning in these lectureship posts. Make sure that you're using the expertise that you're gaining for learning-led research. Use it for SOTL. Now, you may get this first job on the basis of teaching experience, some luck, and a PhD. You're gonna need all three. 
but the second job is going to obviously require that you've demonstrated teaching expertise. Obviously that starts to be taken for granted and then people look at your research. Five, know that this work will be incredibly hard. This contract work is not pleasant. It is not supported. It is not respected. But building something out of this toughness is everything. The greatest teachers change lives. Lecturing in front of a room of attentive students who are enthusiastic, who are excited about learning, that's just tremendous. <laughs> Happens rarely. What about lecturing in front of a room of students that weren't even aware that you walked into the room. I've often described this as lecturing in front of a wall. You actually walk into a room and you're getting so little from the group that it's like lecturing to a wall. So how are you going to focus on this complicated present? How are you going to overcome fear? How are you going to relax? How are you going to motivate? How are you going to change? Teaching in the present is the trick not worrying about what's going to happen in the future. The best teachers live in the moment. First year teaching requires that you are not trapped by unrealistic expectations. Don't aim to be perfect in first year teaching. Aim to be relevant. Start out establishing authority, establishing a leadership model with your students. Then you've got to try and work out in your own head how you transition from a student to a teacher and what that transition means. The strength is, of course, you know what it is to be a student. When I started lecturing, I was three years older than the students I was lecturing. And that's a great advantage. It has some disadvantages, but the advantage is you remember. You remember what it is to learn and have troubles and have difficulties. And you can express that really ev evocatively. So you then have to work through the challenges of often teaching people who are older than you and how you manage that. And also you have to recognize you are a contract teacher. So you will be teaching the courses that no one else wants to teach. And it's going to be dreadful a lot of the time. But what I would say to you, and we're gonna talk about this in the next vlog in particular, is great lecturing is about great organization. So what you need to do is design a course, design the learning outcomes, break the course up into 12 or 13 weeks, depending on the length of your semester, design assessment that confirms your learning outcomes, but also, be, also being able to mark within the parameters of your university. Now, as you can see, each of those points that I glibly listed there, there's a huge skill base behind them, and you need to get that skill base. Six, <laughs> curriculum 101, put points behind what is important. So the best lecturers work out what is important, what's the key learning outcome here, and then they design assessment around it, and they put a lot of points behind it, so you make it worthwhile. The rule in curricular design is incredibly important here, and of course that's a way to also enable universal design, differentiated learning, and you do that, there are lots of techniques to do that. One way is in your selection of readings each week, have a very simple one, a very straightforward one, to help the people that are struggling a bit so they get the definitions, they know what's going on, have a simple reading, but also have a stretch reading every single week. So the best and brightest and the people that are really getting it in the class can also be stretched each week. So make sure at the level of reading, at the level of engagement, you always have differentiated learning every single week. But also, if the learning outcome is important, please put assessment behind it. Where I think academics have a huge series of problems that go, that's really important, and the students aren't concentrating on it, they're not concentrating on it because you didn't put assessment around it, you didn't put points behind it. So what happens is university teaching far too often is experiential. So most academics do not have any teaching qualifications of any kind. <laughs> so the impact of homology teaching as we were taught is particularly problematic in higher education. And look, that may have worked. That may have worked when the university was an elite organisation, okay, where you had a particular sociological grouping of students, okay, and they were taught in a particular way and homology continued. But it certainly doesn't work now, and I would argue it didn't work then. 
So this first job is going to be dreadful. It's going to challenge you as a human. <laughs> These early posts will not be secure. There'll be promises of renewals and renewed contracts and all the rest of it. That invariably will not happen. So you're going to have to work hard, but you're working hard to get the next job. Lecturing work is really tough. It's not just about the lectures and this job will extend beyond the classroom, beyond office hours. It will take over your life. You may have to do some administrative work, but at this lower level, you probably don't have to do too much. It invariably involves managing your course. You're going to be teaching a very, very large first year course and you're going to have to manage the administration of that course. That's a big job too. And you are going to feel disconnected, disconnected from the culture or the politics of your university because you're there for a finite period of time. And it's very easy to feel disconnected. But I think there are advantages of this part-time or fractional lectureship role. Because remember, they, are, they can be a contract. It may be a full-time contract. Increasingly, what we're seeing now is a 0.5 or 0.6 contract. But you need to grab them because they are additional income sources for you. You can focus on your teaching and that's great, develop up your skills and know that you must research and your research will be unpaid. The administrative load won't be too much and perhaps you'll have reasonably flexible hours. That depends now. But the dis disadvantage of these jobs are obviously <laughs> it's not stable at all. There's no job security. There's a lack of opportunity for advancement, a lack of prestige. You still require incredibly high qualifications. You need a PhD, but you're not being paid for that. Seven, don't link the pay to the number of hours that you work. <laughs> this gig is going to be tough. <laughs> this gig is going to be really, really hard yakka. And there is absolutely no relationship in academic life between the number of hours that you work and how much you are paid. Sorry. But remember, the strength of the lectureship post is that you are learning to teach. This first job, you are learning about learning you are learning about teaching. And look, mentors can help you do that. Brutalizing experience <laughs> can help you do that. Peer support, peer review, great stuff, but also a formal teaching and learning program. If you get an opportunity to participate in that, really go for it. And also, and this will be the vlog we do in a couple of, couple of weeks time, we need to ponder the impact of digitization on the lectureship. Digitization adds more work full stop. Students will be engaging with academics pretty well 24-7. You've got discussion fora you've got to work with, born digital objects that you've got to create. So therefore what you need, you need high level communication skills, multimodal technological ability, and also profound respect for student diversity. The salaries will be low, the working environment will be tough, and you'll also be in a competitive environment, so the pay will be reasonably low, but hundreds of people want that job. <laughs> so it'll be competitive. And as a junior faculty member, you will be ignored. There's going to be very little time provided for you, and the preparation that you're going to have to go through will be enormous. I'll tell you why the preparation is so overwhelming, and that is because you are learning while you are doing, and that's never hugely efficient. So everything is going to take longer. Writing lectures, class preparation, curricular design, grading, advising students, understanding the pitch, the level of a class. So you have to know and find ways to communicate that you know what you're doing while you're learning what you're doing. But also, the great advantage of learning in this way, in a scaffolded fashion, is every time you learn a new skill, add it to your CV. Eight, remember the importance of motivation. You are paid very little. You'll have very little job security, but you want to teach in a university. So you've got to create a language. You've got to create a language to translate your motivation to the next generation of students. Make a difference and work out how to make a difference. 
If you're going to be on any form of contract that's not an adjunct academy or it's not a casual post, then you're going to have to find a way to value add to your employment. And one way through that is to focus on the motivation of students, which will, of course, reduce attrition. Nine, important one for you, enact full economic costing. Getting that first contract job is about luck, but it's also about mobility. Are you prepared to move for it? And are you motivated? You've also got to confirm your previous work experience and its value to your present job, but also the desired salary. And this is what no one tells you. Remember that you're going to have to pay your bills. The salary will be low. So look at what it costs to live in particular cities. Look at the how much it's going to cost to commute, to get yourself to work and home each day. Now, online teaching has its advantages because many of these costs are reduced. But I think too often, and I understand this, you've done all this casual work and suddenly you get a contract and you see a salary and you go, wow, money. Like <laughs> you've lived without money for so long, you go, wow, money. But recognize <laughs> what it costs to move and what it's going to cost you to accept that contract. And therefore, what's the value add? So how does this contract fit into your life plan? This contract's really got to be revenue neutral for you. So at the end of the year, at the end of the six months, you haven't lost money. Yes, I said you haven't lost money. Most contracts you will. So can you pay your bills? But also, what's the value of this contract to enabling you to get the next job? So what's the contract going to do for your CV, your publications, widening out your teaching experiences, widening out your research experiences, building your online presence, and also developing new referees, crucial. So when you're considering these options, think about the present, the cost in the present, but also the value in the future. 10, have an answer to the question, why you enjoy teaching. This will be a question in every interview you will do for the rest of your life, but it's also a great question for you to answer yourself. Why do you like teaching? What do you get out of it? What are the courses that you would like to teach? What's your ideal teaching position? How will you manage the teaching workload. Now, do not answer, I am desperate. <laughs> I understand, I'm, I'm just desperate, I'm just desperate. Instead, you're gonna to have to look people in the eye and explain to them why teaching matters to you. Read your contract. <laughs> Really, really read it. There is some weird stuff in contracts at the moment. Make sure you read the contract. You're probably going to have to sign it anyway because the post is so rare, but be aware with your eyes open what you're going into. Now, I know you're desperate for work, but make sure you know what you've signed. Yes, you are aiming for security, but it's going to take some track record to get you to permanence or tenure now. Inexperienced teachers always focus on the what rather than the how or the why. So I can always tell a teacher is inexperienced because they're worried that they won't have enough information that the students are gonna find them out. The problem in teaching and learning is never the what, what you know information. It's always how the information is put into a communication system and why that information matters. So start with the big questions. What is this course about? How does it fit into a degree? What are the students going to be able to do at the end of it that they can't do now? Those three questions will give you the scope and the scale that you're going to need. Shape and limit the material, create learning outcomes, create assessment. Know that all that students care about at the start of every course is how do I pass? <laughs> that's it. So students come into the course on the first week and go, how do I pass this? And that's cool. The best lecturers in international higher education can deepen that motivation and quickly. Now, there'll be some students all the way through, they only want to pass, we wish them well. But if you are a lecturer, you're something more. 
Yes, you've got a very special skill set. You have to communicate those skills to others. But you also have to hold on to the vista, the vision of your present, so it can connect you to the vision and the vista of your future. The present can be exhausting. Keep the motivation and know that it will lead you to a future. And you must care for students. The duty of care, personally, professionally, intellectually, is where the best of teaching and learning begins. This is our lecturer. I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out.